Okay, so we're going to dedicate the class a very good friend of mine, that's his father's Yarzeit, Moshe Ben Rina. So, Bezat Hashem, his Neshama should have an Aliyah, and also Shoshana, Leah, but Baruch Meir. It's also her Yarzeit, right? Bezat Hashem also should have an Aliyah, and also we have to, we want to dedicate the class to Refua of uh, Dalia Bat Shaina, right? It's Dalia Bat Shaina? Shaina. Should have a refuah shlema, and anyone who needs refuah, Bezrat Hashem should have refuah, whoever needs Yeshua and Parnasa, and especially the ones <coughs> that we dedicate their Aliyat Neshama, should have Aliyat Neshama. Bezrat Hashem very soon, Yekitsu ve'yiranu shokhne afar ve'em betocham. Bezrat Hashem should happen very soon. So what we want to talk about today, we're very close to Purim. And when the kids start going online to look for uh, costumes, then you know it's close to Purim. And Baruch Hashem Purim is one of the most special holidays that we have around the year. And <clears throat> we mentioned last time, we had a class before Hanukkah, and I mentioned that holiday we say in Hebrew Chag. And Chag... It has a different meaning than the word holiday. In English, holiday, you take a vacation. Holiday is going to Mexico. In Hebrew, Chag is a festival. It's something uh, happy. But really, the word Chag comes from the word Lachug. Lachug is to go in a circle. If you're looking at a clock, you know, the hands in the clock, they're called Mechogim. The words in Hebrew, they have a, a much more uh, deeper meaning. So Chag means something that, like a, a hand in a clock that goes around and always returns to the same spot. So Chag means that once a year, a special godly light comes back to the world and affects the world. Like we, we, one example that we see is a birthday. Because really, why do we celebrate a birthday? I mean, I was born 40 years ago. Why? I need to celebrate it every year. But that's the day that I kind of like close the cycle of the year. And for whatever reason, uh, they, they made it. Okay, so that's the day that I get presents. Like uh, the rest of the year I cannot get presents. This is the day that I have to, the, I have to celebrate. The reality is this, that because on that specific day, uh, a very special godly light came down to the world and changed something. So especially the holidays. Now, most of the holidays that we have, they're biblical, they're from the Torah. So we have Rosh Hashanah, we have Yom Kippur, we have Sukkot, and then of course we have Pesach, very soon coming up after that Shavuot. So some of the holidays we got in the Torah. But we have two special holidays that happened in our history, and uh, our sages decided to make a holiday out of it. Which, that in itself just goes to show you how special it is, because we had many other miracles in our history, and they didn't make a holiday out of that. If we would go in the history of our nation, we will count thousands of miracles that were not less uh, great than the miracle of Hanukkah and Purim. And nobody made a miracle out of that. And I mean, nobody made a holiday out of that. If we would have a holiday for every miracle that happened to us all day long, we would be eating and, and fasting and getting drunk. So just by the fact that we actually celebrate Purim and Hanukkah, that already tells us what a special day it is. So, there's I met a lot of things to talk about Purim. One th most important thing that I find that is most connected to us about this holiday is something that we have to learn from the holiday itself. Now, we mentioned uh, uh, in the past, we had a class here before Pesach. So we mentioned the whole motion of Pesach, the whole concept of Pesach is the concept of going out of my limitations. That once a year, I can gather around, I can charge myself with energy that allows me to go out of my, my daily limitations. And every year when Pesach comes back, that's the day that I can plug in, I can charge and get the energy for the rest of the year to have the, the power to, every time that I struggle with something that limits me, then I have the power to go out of my limitation. So that's the Pesach. And of course, we know that Rosh Hashanah is the day that I get blessed for the rest of the year, and, and Yom Kippur is when I uh, get, can get, be forgiven, and so forth. So also Purim has a very special uh, uh, power that comes down that day. 
Now, first we have to understand what does it mean that a, a godly light shines in the world? Because a lot of people say, okay, okay, so you told me a, sh a light shines in the world. Big deal. So I don't see any light. Besides that, I see everyday lights. Uh, every day, Hashem is shining in the world. What's the difference? I don't see with my own eyes a difference on Purim, or on Pesach, or any other day. Now, the fact that I don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There were words that they came in our history that they would actually see the world completely different on Shabbat. And they would see the world completely different on a, on a Yom Tov. And, and they, they literally saw with their own eyes how the world changes. We just don't see it because our eyes are very limited. Exactly like we spoke before, if we would see things that are above normal, then most likely half the population of the world would be freaking out. If you imagine now if you would see suddenly something sh shifting in the universe, suddenly the colors of the star sky uh, changes. So Hashem did us a favor and He make us, made us blind. You know, ignorance is bliss. Sometimes when you don't see so many things, then you, it's easier to live your life. But the reality is that something changes. Now, <clears throat> the, this godly light that we learn about in many different places that comes and shines in this world is, is, can be compared to an energy. And, you know, sometimes you can uh, play music and the energy of the music is very mellow. So it makes you very mellow, or if the music is depressing, then it puts you in like this sad mode, and pitom you start crying, you don't even know why you cry. If the music is very upbeat, then you start uh, getting energized. And if you're really thinking about it, why? Why does the music, tunes, change my mood? I mean, just now, we drove down here, so, as you remember from many other classes, always my kids join me, they join me now, but my mom waited outside and she took them. So we're sitting in the car and of course one of the kids is like, Abba, put music on. So we put music on and when there was a, a, a slow uh, song and they were like, it's boring, so let's put something else. And then when there's a music with a little bit of action, they're all like jumping up and down. So, and it's the same with us. If you put now a, a good beat of a song, everybody starts moving, whether you like it or not. You know, the shoulders starts moving and other parts of the body starts moving. So the energy in the music actually uh, moves us. Uh, and and the, one of the best way of actually seeing it is a, in music. But even in a, in a, if you watch a movie, if the movie is very uh, light and funny, then your energy is different. You laugh and you, you, you're totally different. If it's a scary movie, you're like, you're all tense. If it's an action movie, you're like in your, uh, in your seat. So we see that we get affected by something that is, so to say, uh, energetic around us. You can feel it in a party. Sometimes you'll go into a party and the party is, you know, a dead party. And sometimes you go into a certain place and the energy there is so powerful that you, you don't even know why and, and it's affecting you. So there is some type of a power, that people call it energy, but the, the Kabbalistic term to it is called a He'ara, a revelation, a godly revelation. This is in, in Lashon Kodesh, it's called He'ara Elokit, a godly revelation. If Hashem decides to shine His godly light in a certain way, we will be affected by that. So now it's a, it's a cloudy day. Just think that we had a little bit of gas in the air, two kilometers above us, how it changes our entire mood. Why, the only thing that it is, just a bunch of gas to, to, uh, together, may, forming these thick clouds, then the rays of the sun don't come here. The tone of the light, even in the, in the house and in the street, is darker, it's heavier, it's colder. Sometimes something that is so not tangible can completely affect your, your entire day. You can go now on a vacation, and if you have a, a, a day like today, it's a miserable day. It's not fun. You don't want to do anything. Have a little bit of sun out, and a little bit of a, a nice energy from the birds and the, and the air. You're in a completely com different mood. So we totally get affected by the energy that is surrounding us. If we were much more sensitive and much more aware, then we would actually see that energy. And we would see how the energy is affecting us. Some people are so sensitive, they know how to tap into the energy. 
And that's the sec- where the secret lies. That's one of the main, many reasons why we pray every day. Because by me praying, I'm allowing myself to tap into certain energies. Now, there's constantly a lot of energies around us. Imagine now a big uh, mall. And technically, if you would think technically, why do I need to go into a mall with 500 stores? Or 30 stores? Isn't it enough to have one store? Just put me in Bloomingdale. It has all the, th- the things that I need, or whatever it is, uh, you know, Macy's, or I'm just throwing a name. It has everything in it. It has the, the men's department, the women's department, the kids' department. They have everything that I don't need to start going out from one store to another. And even if I, when I go shopping, I go to a mall, there's 50 shoe stores. Well, technically, one might say, give me one shoe store with all the shoes and I'll choose. And some stores you walk in, it's just enough that the, the person that sells there is, is, is not nice, you walk out. The energy is like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to buy here. So we constantly get affected by, by changes, which technically... We don't need all these variety. We don't need such a large variety in anything. Technically, we could do, do just good with one option. That's why in the, in the desert now, we're reading it now this week, they started eating man. They didn't have different types of food. One type of food for 40 years. In their mind, they were able to tap into some type of an energy that the taste of the man would be totally different whatever they want. They wanted it to be like steak, it was tasting like steak. They wanted it to be like sushi, they would, it would taste like sushi. What are we eating tonight? Let me think. Okay, I want a hamburger. But the reality was that the man itself looked the same, it was the same substance, same quantity, just they were able to tap into to the, to the difference of it, so to say. And they were pretty living pretty simple there. They didn't have malls in the desert, they didn't have anything. Just imagine millions of people, we're now reading it, it's close to, close to us. We evaluate, our, our sages evaluate about 3 million people walking in the desert. You just imagine the show. When you tell somebody we were walking in the desert, you imagine a bunch of you know, guys with, uh, with robes, with sandals, and a camel. This was like uh, half of Israel, half of the population of Israel walking in the desert. And they had systems with them. Can you imagine moving such a, such a big amount of people? They had a whole system. Just imagine how they used to put the Mishkan back and, and tear it apart all the time. And, and, and this was a big structure. And, and they were able to do that, and they lived in the desert, and they lived better than what we think that we, that we, live, that we live. Why? Because they were able to, to tap into the energy. Now there's constantly around us a certain energy. If I know how to tap into it, then I will derive something, some benefit out of this energy. Now if you go on a vacation, what makes the vacation special? The, the company, the hotel, the scenery. What makes the, 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 the holiday so special? We've been to a, a certain place two or three times in a row. Each time is a completely different energy. A few years ago, we were invited a few Pesachs in a row to a retreat. It happened to be that exactly two of my kids were born right after Pesach, so it, we had two years that my wife was due around Pesach time, so, so she was like, I can't do Pesach, and we, we got invited. My wife is good with that. She says, okay, let's go to a retreat, you'll talk, <laughs> and we'll get a discount. So everybody's uh, on vacation, and I have to give lectures all day long. So, but it did get us a good discount, and we were invited to this beautiful Pesach retreat. Then I would never in my right mind think of going to such a thing, and after three years in a row going to such a retreat, both my wife and me agreed, this is not Pesach. It's just an extravaganza of food. It's not the actual holiday. You don't feel the holiday. But it was spoiling, and my wife needed that. So the amazing thing is that we went there one year after the other. Every year was completely different. The, the, the group of the people was different. The, the, the energy was different. And one might say, what's the difference? Same hotel, same caterer, same time of a year, same weather. Everything is the same. Why would it be completely different? <clears throat> so the point to take from that is that there's constantly energy around us. 
Kadosh Baruch Hu, if one wants to somehow imagine what is Hashem, imagine just some type of a magnetic field of energy. I mean, people will imagine in their mind an old guy with a long beard sitting on a big chair and throwing orders in, in the heavens. But really, Hashem doesn't have a shape, doesn't have a size. And if you want to somehow relate then just imagine this unbelievable, powerful, magnetic field of unbelievable energy that the energy constantly changes. And the same way that everything in this world changes, the, the seasons in the year change, the, the colors of, of the day change, the trees outside, everything is constantly changing. Imagine now the world will never change. Everything will be the same colors, everything will be the same taste, everything will be boring, basically. And even the variety that we have now is nothing compared to how it's going to be very soon when Mashiach comes. Very soon when Mashiach is going to come, one of the first few things that we're going to start noticing that we're going to have a lot more colors in the world. What we see now, the world is very dull. Very, very dull colors. And when Mashiach is going to come very soon, the colors are going to change. We're going to have millions of more shades of colors and everything is going to be vivid and strong. Same thing with the food. We're not going to have um, any more all these processed food that you have now in the supermarkets. We're not going to have any more Cheetos and, and uh, Bamba and Bisley and all these things. It's all going to be fruits and vegetables. And all the trees, they call it in Hebrew, a tree that doesn't have fruit. 90% of the fr trees out there, they don't have fruit. What do we have now? 10, 15, 20 types of fruit? when you think about it, and then hundreds of other types of uh, trees that they don't give fruit. When Mashiach is going to come, these trees are going to start giving fruit. And when the Prophet says, Ma'adanim imatsu ke'afar, that, the, that uh, Ma'adan is like a, something, a treat, will be as, uh, as easy to get as sand. And you know how they teach the kids that there's going to be lollipops on the trees. So there's not going to be lollipops on the trees, just that the fruit is going to be, be so sweet and so unbelievable that what we have now is disgusting. I mean, once in a blue moon you fall on a good uh, pear or a good apple and you're like, wow, that's a real good piece of fruit. The rest is dull. So very soon that's going to change too. But <clears throat> what we want to take from all that is that Hashem constantly is very dynamic and He's changing His energy. Now, if I know how to tap into this energy, then what I get from that is I derive some type of benefit. That's, that's the whole concept. That's why our sages decided for us that we have to pray. Because praying is not necessarily asking for my needs. It's meditating to bring myself to a point that I can tap into the, the energy of the day. And then I derive something out of it. I will derive pleasure or happiness or, or whatever it is. So some days of the year, the energy is completely, completely different and unbelievably more powerful. Like, like uh, 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 in, in a way that cannot be compared to other days. Just that we're so uh, uh, low in our level that we don't feel the difference. That's why on the, all, on, the whole, on the festivals, we're not allowed to work. Because by working, we're desecrating the holiness of the day. We don't see it. For us, it's like, okay, another day. So I'm just dressed nicer. That's it. Now, two holidays, the godly revelation that we call it a second ago an energy is so powerful. That's Purim and, uh, and, uh, Rosh, and uh, Hanukkah. These are the two days that a certain energy, a certain godly light came to the world. And when the sages saw what's going on, now when I'm saying sages, I'm not talking about a rabbi with a long beard that knows the entire Gemara inside out. I'm talking about tzaddikim that we cannot even understand their level, that even the tzaddik, tzaddikim that what we can understand in our generation is not even to compare to these uh, men. So our sages, they had unbelievable Ruach HaKodesh, half of them were prophets, they were able to see things that we, we can't imagine what, what they would see. So they, when they would see something, they would be able to understand from it and, for example, to decide, okay, today's going to be a holiday. For example, with the miracle of Hanukkah, they saw what's going on in Hanukkah. They had many, many miracles in Hanukkah. They won the war and then the miracle of the oil and there was a lot of other different miracles happening. The first year, there wasn't Hanukkah. 
Only the next year, when the sages at the time saw the exact same godly revelation, they were like, oh, it returned. It came back. Therefore, okay, it's going to continue coming back now for the rest of the generations. Therefore, we're going to make a holiday out of it. Meaning that the holiday me doesn't mean that we're going to uh, celebrate or commemorate that it came back. Rather, we have to, to prepare ourselves for that special day so I'm, I'm a, a worthy vessel to receive this godly revelation again. That's why in many other miracles in history, it is okay, a miracle, very nice, but it didn't repeat itself. The sea only split once. That's it. And the plagues in Mitzrayim, they only happened once. It didn't repeat itself. So, <clears throat> at the time of Purim and Hanukkah, this unbelievable godly revelation came down to the world. And not only that, it kept repeating itself. Now, I want to learn and to prepare what do I have to take out of this holiday of Purim that is coming very soon. It's not about stuffing myself with Mishloche Manot and all the treats, that after that you can be sick for three days just from all the sugar, from all the candy. And it's not about the, the, the costume. It's, not about, it's, it's much more to it. And you see that in the holiday of Purim, there are four special mitzvot. I think that in the last year, when we had a class here about Purim, we went through all these four mitzvot, and, and I explained the, the more of a mystical part, why, why we do these mitzvot. I'm almost certain we had the class here. If not, then, then I'm sure you can find it online. But then I talk about the, the, the four mitzvot of Purim, they, they, they have a very special spiritual connection. First of all, if you notice, they all start with the letter Mem, because we have Mikra Megillah, then Mishloach Manot, Matanot Levyonim, and Mishteh Simcha. So these four mitzvot, they all start with the letter Mem. And Mem is a very, very powerful letter, because we have two types of Mems. We have a regular Mem, and then we have the Mem Stuma, the last Mem, that is a closed box. And the first mem is almost closed from all directions, just that it has a little gap in the bottom of an opening. And the letter mem, why is it so special? If you look, the first letter that starts the Torah is bet, which one might argue and say the, the letter that should start the Torah should be aleph, not bet. What's, why would it start with bet? So there's many explanations why the Torah starts with the letter bet. But one of the reasons is, that if you look at the structure of the letter, then it has a roof, it has a floor, a base, it has one wall on the right side, that's how you form the letter, and then the left side is completely open. There's like a, a whole gap there. And Kadosh Baruch created the world with the letter bet because he wanted to have one side open for the Yetzirah to come in. Because if the world was perfect, then there wouldn't be a place for the Yetzirah. If there wouldn't be a Yetzirah, then what, what good am I doing here? I came here to refine myself, not to, not to sit here and waste my time. And the only way for me to refine myself and to work on myself is if there's some type of resistance. If I go now to the, to the gym and I sit like this on a very fancy machine, if I don't move, nothing's going to happen. I'm just going to sit on the, on the seat of the gym. If I need to do some type of exercise, it has to be some type of resistance with weight. And then I can do a certain motion. If I just sit there and I don't do nothing, nothing will happen. It might be a beautiful gym. I might be wearing a very good outfit and pay a lot of money for the membership, but not, no benefit will happen. In order for something to happen, some type of benefit, whether it be to get in shape or to lose weight or to be strong, has to be some type of resistance. And the resistance is in the gym is by weight. If you would look at the logic of a gym, what kind of a sport is it? I'm pushing a, a piece of metal. I'm, 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 I'm torturing myself with heavy weight. And then I get tired. And then I get uh, sweaty. I mean, that doesn't look like so fun. Give me a ball. That looks like much more fun for me to bounce a ball and to kick it or to throw it into a, to a, a basket. But the reality is that the, the effort and the energy that I can get from the gym is that I will put me in shape, will build my muscles and so forth, but that can only be done with resistance. So the Kadosh Baruch Hu had to bring resistance to this world. If I wouldn't have a Yetzirah, then I would be like, okay, nothing's happening. Well, what would I fight with? 
I mean, you can take now a world class champion in boxing. If you put him by himself in a ring, who's he going to fight? He's going to just swing his hands in the air. There's no fight here. There's no thrill. It's, it's kind of sad, but the most popular sport in the world is any type of sport that two men fight with each other. You put now two men in a ring and put some cameras on them, you have 150 million people watching it and cheering and going crazy. And when you're thinking about it, it's kind of a, what kind of a sadistic sport it is. I'm putting two men in a ring and they're beating each other up. And in all olden days, you know, in the time of the gladiators, and so they would do, do it with animals. And then some people, they have a custom with the sports that they put animals together to see the animals fight. It's some type of a weird distortion in, the, in, our, in this world's intelligence that to put two individuals in one place and let them beat each other up, it's a thrill. And people bet money, and if he, my, the guy that I'm cheering, he knocks the other guy down, I'm, you know, get all excited. What are you getting excited for? Because somebody just... Uh, uh, physically hurts another person? I mean, but if you really go down to the depth of it, what kind of a weird sport they call it, it is that two people fight with each other. But it is one of the most popular sports in the world. There's a thrill. Let's see who's going to be stronger. That's going to be who's going to fight, who's going to overcome. And especially when it comes to a nice type of a, a martial arts, then there's beautiful effects. This guy is going to do a fancy kick and he's going to block him. And, and this is when you're really thinking of it, this is a, a, a very dominating entertainment in this world, unfortunately. And now it trickles into the, all the video games. The, the video games is all about fighting. And, but the, the point is that it, anything that comes down to this world, it means that something originated before that. Nothing comes down to this world before it originated in the spiritual world, and nothing comes down to this world without having a source, which means there's a source to this fight. And the source to this fight is that Hashem put me in a ring, and with me, He put a Yetzirah. And He says, okay, now fight it. And in Shemaim, there are sitting millions of angels, and they're, let's see, who's going to win? The Yetzirah is going to now come and convince him to do something. Let's see if he's going to fight back. And all day long, I'm in a ring. And all day long, the Yetzirah is punching me. And sometimes I just lay on the ground because I can't take it anymore. Sometimes I punch back. Sometimes I get up. Sometimes I'm just in the motion of running. Sometimes I'm in the motion of attacking. But I'm in a ring. Kalosh Baruch put me in a ring and all day long I'm fighting. And I'm fighting my Yetzirah. <coughs> And that's what Hashem wanted. Hashem wanted to be resistance in this world. Because if there wouldn't be resistance, then there wouldn't be any point to this world. The point is, is to get in shape. Our sages say, Ratza HaKadosh Baruch Hu lezakot et Yisrael, Afira chirba lehem Torah umitzvot. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give us a merit, so he gave us a lot of Torah and mitzvahs. So this is one way of explaining the, the, the verse. But the Zohar says, Ratza HaKadosh Baruch Hu, lo lezakot, rather lezakech. It's the same letters, different meaning. Lezakech means to refine. Which means the Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to refine me, therefore he gave me a lot of mitzvahs to do and a lot of Torah to learn, because that's hard, to do the mitzvahs are hard. Now, if I wouldn't have a Yetzirah, I would all day long be in a shul. I wouldn't even take that feeling off me. I wouldn't even think for one second to lie, or to steal, or to, to look the wrong direction, or anything. Because I would be programmed to do just good, like an angel. Angels don't sin. If you would now remove the Yetzirah, all you would want to do all along is just be connected to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. the Kadosh Baruch Hu says, okay, no, 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 wait. <laughs> Let me put something in between. Now we'll see how much you, you fight for that. And that's kind of the name of the game. Kadosh Baruch Hu put a Yetzirah, and now I have to resist it and I have to fight it. All day long. Now, every now and then, Kadosh Baruch gives me some type of a, of a break. Like in a ring, after two minutes, ding, 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 then the fighters go to the side, then they wash themselves up. Kadosh Baruch also gives me breaks every now and then. If not, it wouldn't be fair. So, the Kadosh Baruch created the world with the letter Bet. I mean, he didn't create the world with the letter Bet. He actually created the world with the letter Yud. But the first letter of the Torah is Bet to show us that the world was created with an open side that the Yetzirah can come in and start making 
problems. The Yetzera has seven names. One of the names of the Yetzera is called Ruach Tzfonit. And we see it in many different places, but Ruach Tzfonit, it's called the, the, the northern wind. And why n northern wind? The Tzafon is where the bet is open. And, and Ruach is where the, the wind, where the Yetzirah can come in, but Tzafon comes also from the word Tzafun. Tzafun is something that is hidden. In our days, we are very aware of something in our, in our system that is called Matzpun. Matzpun is my conscious, that I have something in me constantly moving inside, in my conscious. I did something wrong, it's, oh, you didn't do something wrong. He didn't do so good, or I do, whatever it is, I constantly have this power in me, this certain mo motion that we call it conscious. In Hebrew it's called matzpun. Why is it called matzpun? Because it comes from the word tzafun. Tzafun is something that is hidden very, very deep. Another word that we it comes from the same root is what we, is what we, do, we do on uh, Pesach, the Afikoman. The Fikoman is also called Tzafun. It's very hidden, very, very deep. So there are seven types of Yetzirah, I mean seven names to the Yetzirah. Each one corresponds to one character trait of the Yetzirah. But the worst one is this Tzafun, it's this hidden one. And this is why the, word, the, the Torah starts with the letter Bet, <coughs> to give the opportunity to the Yetzirah to come in. When Mashiach is going to come, Bezrat Hashem, very soon, he's going to close that Mem. He's going to close that Bet to be, make it a Mem. Excuse me. That's why when we left Mitzrayim, we're going to read it in a few weeks, that the Kadosh Baruch told the Jews, Vasitim Mikdash, Veshachanti Betocham. Now, if you read the, the verse in Hebrew, it doesn't make much sense, because it says, Vasitim, you should do to me, Asitim is plural, Li Mikdash, Mikdash is one, Veshachanti Betocham, and I will drill in them. You should say, Veshachanti Betocho, in it. I mean, the words in Hebrew, they, they, there's plural and there's si single. So it would make much more sense that you should build me a tabernacle, a mishkan, and I will dwell in it. But the Torah says, Vasitim le mishkan, and you should make for me a tabernacle, and I will dwell in, in them. So our sage says, okay, yeah, in each and every one of you, the mishkan is my body, a mishkan is a tabernacle, something very, very holy, and Hashem says, if you would make your body a mishkan, I will dwell in you. So my body is a mishkan, my house is a mishkan, my business is a mishkan, my mind, everything that I own is my tabernacle, my mishkan. Mishkan comes from the word lishkon, to, to be in. Also comes from the word shechina. The shechina dwells in something that is worthy to the shechina to come in. So Hashem says, just make yourself a mishkan. If you make yourself a mishkan, I will come and dwell in there. So if you make your house a mishkan, the house is kosher, Put mezuzot, like the Torah says, put some t uh, books of, of Torah, keep Shabbat in the house, keep the energy in the house. If the, if the house is, uh, is holy, then the Shekhinah dwells in the house. And sometimes you feel it. You walk into some people's houses, you're like, wow, this is unbelievable holiness in this home. And some homes you go into the house and you feel disgusting. Now this is one way of building a mishkan. My office can also be a mishkan that I run my business honest and I don't lie and I don't cheat and I don't steal. And most important, I want my mind to be a mishkan. That my thoughts are clear and clean and pure and, and there's no jungle going on in my mind. <clears throat> and if a bad thought comes into my mind, I push it away right away. Like if now will come a robber into the home and jump over the fence and start making noise in the backyard and banging on the windows, I'm not going to let him in. I'm going to call the police right away. Listen, there's some crazy guy here. He's trying to get into my home. But that's the same thing that every day I'm being attacked by, by a robber like that a hundred times a day with, with these weird thoughts that they come like a meshugane, a, a like a crazy person outside and tries to get in. The difference is that I let them in. In my thoughts, I don't push them out like a robber. Somebody will now knock on the door. You look in the, in the hole or you look in the camera, you don't recognize, or it looks like somebody uh, not so good, go away. <clears throat> the only problem is that I don't do it when they, these thoughts come to my mind. <clears throat> so I also have to make my mind a mishkan. And of course, needless to say, my body. But <clears throat> when our sages were explaining that I have to make my body a mishkan, 
comes the Arizal and he says, no, when the Torah is talking about Vasitim Nemishkan Veshachanti Betocham, if you took the letter, the word Betocham, if you write it in Hebrew, <coughs> if you split the word, you can read it Betoch Mem. Bet Taf Vav Chaf, it's Betoch in, and the last letter is Mem, which means that if if you build me a Mishkan, then I will dwell in the Mem, in the Mishkan, in the, the four walls that are sealed. And that's why Hashem told, told us, you have to build yourself a, a, a tabernacle. <coughs> when Mashiach is going to come very soon, he's going to close the Bet. The Bet is now open, so the Yetzirah can come in. The, the prophet Yeshayahu says, The power of impurity I will remove very soon when Mashiach is going to come. So... <coughs> So, right now it's still open. Now, we got to kind of sidetrack to that because I mentioned that all the mitzvahs of Purim, they start with Mem and they have a meaning to that. But that's a whole class in itself and, and if you don't remember, if you weren't here, go look it online because it really is explaining each mitzvah of the Mikra Megillah and Matanot Lev Yonim and Mishlu Achmanot and the feast and Mishteh. How is that got to do with, with what we need to do, which is actually a, a co totally connected to the redemption. But really what happens, if you want to see the hint in Purim, and I want to tap into something, at least this coming Purim, <coughs> is really the story is not only a historical event. Yes, it did happen. It happened many years ago. Just try to go to the time machine. And imagine the Jews are in Eretz Israel in Yerushalayim, they have the Beit HaMikdash, everything is going great. Suddenly the Beit HaMikdash gets destroyed and they get kicked out of Israel. After 410 years that they had Beit HaMikdash, can you imagine? We barely have the Knesset for 70 years and look what a mess. They had Beit HaMikdash for 410 years, they had a, very, a good run. And then unfortunately the generations became worse and worse, they had three sins that created a problem, idol worship, uh, forbidden relations, and bloodshed. And as a result from these three sins, the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, was destroyed. When they got kicked out of Israel, the, there was a prophecy that the exile will be exactly 70 years. So they already knew, we're going out for 70 years, like time out, for a little kid. And they came back, and sure enough, 67 years later happened the story with Purim. And then after that, it took about three years, then they came back to, to, to Eretz Israel and started building the next Beit HaMikdash, took a few years, and then they, they built the second temple. The second temple got destroyed, unfortunately, from one major sin, and this sin is called Sinat Chinam, hating another person for no reason. Now, the first temple got destroyed from three different sins. Since the sins were revealed, then the length of the exile was revealed. The second time the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, it was destroyed from a sin that you don't really see it. I mean, you can, you can pretend you like somebody, and really you don't, and they don't see it. You can smile all day long and pretend you're their friend, and you, in your heart, you hate that person. Now, since the sin is not revealed, then the length of the exile is not revealed, and that's why we're still in exile. <coughs> Now really when one thinks of it, why are we still in exile? I mean, we're in exile for close to 2,000 years, it's enough, that's it, we got the point. We got the point, we want Mashiach to come already, everybody's ready. I think everybody already got the point. Hashem is already pushing everybody's buttons to make sure that we're already asking for Mashiach from our Kishke, not because we, we, we think that we want. Kadosh Baruch is making sure now that everybody's being pressed some way or another whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it's relationships, doesn't matter what it is, Kadosh Baruch is pushing everybody to a corner. To a point that some people totally ignore it, the smart people say, that's it, we need Mashiach. The, the only solution is Mashiach. Not a politician, not a cure, not money. The Mashiach is the only solution to everything. So Purim is connected to the redemption. And if you go back into the time machine, just imagine the story. The Jews are in uh, Persia, in Iran. Suddenly he rises up, a Hitler, a Haman, says, I want to kill them all. Let's get rid of them, once and for all. 
<coughs> and you know the whole story, there's a decree, and of course Esther comes to the rescue, and Mordechai, I don't want to go into the historical part of it, but there was a miracle. And the miracle allowed us to be, to the, to the decree, to, to be Sweden, and to change. Now, in the Megillah, the Megillah was written really in Ruach HaKodesh. The Megillah is not a, a story, and not necessarily a, a, a history book. It was written in, in, in the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. And in the Megillah is unbelievable depths of information. That's why it's called Megillah Tester. Because the name of the queen was not Esther, her name was Hadassah. Rather, later on, she was called Esther because in the Megillah, Esther comes from the word Lehastir, to, to be concealed. And everything is concealed in the Megillah, so it got the name of Megillat, the Megillah of the, whatever is concealed, Esther. So she got the name Esther. Really, her name was Hadassah and not Esther. <coughs> But in the Megillah has unbelievable depths of, of, of uh, secrets and mysticism just in the Megillah. And it's talking about many different Kabbalistic concepts. And if you go one by one in the Megillah, you can actually see how it's, what it's referring to. But it's talking at the time that there was a, a concealment, a hester panim. And it's constantly talking about Hamelech. Now, when it's mentioning Hamelech HaChashverosh, it's talking about the King HaChashverosh. But if you see, in the entire Megillah, there's not the word of Hashem. There's not Yud Kevavke, not Elohim, not Aleph Dalil Nun Yud. There's not any words of Hashem, only a Melech. Any time that it's talking about a Melech without a Hashverosh, it's referring to the king of the world, of the master of the universe. And of course, it's talking about the history of what happened then. But the reality is that we relive this history all the time, especially now in our day. Because right before the, a redemption and right before a building of a Beit HaMikdash has to be a situation like a Purim. So y if you look at the entire story of Purim, there's a, a resemblance in our generation too. Not necessarily in 2017, but we also had a Haman 75 years ago that wanted to destroy the Jews in one shot. He actually br brought it into action. And the, there was a, 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 a miracle, and we were saved. I don't know if you saw, there's now a movie going on in the social networks that somebody made, how they're showing that in the Megillat Esther, 10 uh, sons of Haman were hung. And they were hung in the same day. And the, the, in this video, they're showing how there are 10 uh, SS officers that were marshal, uh, court marshaled after the Holocaust and they're all hung, which was unheard of. Usually they would be killed in a lethal injection or a shot. And they hung them all. And in this video, they're explaining it real nice how in the Megillah, it's talking about that these 10 uh, monsters will be hung. And 2,000 years later, these uh, uh, officers were, were hung and, uh, and they found guilty and, and were judged to death. So the entire story of Purim is actually happening right now. Uh, you, if you just analyze the story of Purim, you will see that it's happening right now, just that right now the concealment is a hundred times more powerful because we do not have a Mordechai. We don't have a tzaddik in our generation that will come and uh, save the day. This time it's the job of Mashiach. Interestingly, they have the same letter starting his Mordechai, his Mashiach. But we also don't have an Esther right now. <clears throat> but the entire idea is that uh, the history repeats itself. Now when we analyze the, the four mitzvot that we have, now the mitzvot, everybody's obligated. Women, everybody has to do it. Uh, 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 the women are not exempt from these mitzvot. So the first one is called Mikra Megillah. Mikra Megillah, <clears throat> Uh, you know, I'm going to add what I explained in, the, in a previous class because I mentioned it last year that these four mitzvot, it's actually a secret for us to know how to hasten the geula. So I want to explain it in a different way, but I'll point that a part also just to remind you. So Mikra Megillah corresponds to learning Torah. So 
these four mitzvot will actually give us a hint what we need to do to hasten the Geulah. So the first one is learning Torah. We have to be involved in learning Torah. But on the other hand, the hint, what I need to learn from that, is that in the time of the Mikra Megillah, when we read the Megillah, and women are also obligated, they have to clean, and they have to make sure the kids are quiet. And if you missed one word of the Megillah, you have to hear it again. You literally have to be focused and listen to every word. Really what happens in the time of the Megillah is the greatest godly revelation of the day. That's when the, the, the door, so to say, opens. That's when you start tapping into to this energy. Now the next mitzvah is Mishloach Manot. And after that is Matanot Lev Yonim. Mishloach Manot is not necessarily a bag that I put a few uh, treats in it and I give it to another person. That's just to symbolize it. But really, Mishloach Manot, the mystical explanation is, is that Arizal explains that each and every one of us has a godly spark in me that enlivens me. And each one of these godly sparks are completely unique. And Mishloch Manot is I give you a bag of treats and you give me a bag of treats. So we're switching the presence, so to say. <clears throat> In the spiritual term, what I'm doing is that I'm sharing with you my godly spark, my energy, so to say, and you're sharing with me. And we're switching with each other. Now, what do I need to derive out of that? What does that got to do with me? This is the ultimate Avat Israel that I'm sharing everything that I have. I see myself completely equal to you. Now, when, I'm, when I was a kid, we used to have this beautiful Mishloch Emanot, and I would come to school, and the custom in the schools here is that you put all the Mishloch Emanot on the table, and each one comes, and you just pull out a Mishloch Manot. And I would always give the most beautiful Mishloch Manot, and I would always get the worst one. And I would write, this is what I get? <laughs> to two bambas and a piece of bisli, I would always get the worst mishloach manot. And I always got so upset, I was like, I get the best mishloach manot. And I'm getting like the worst one. Like a bag with two bambas in there. <laughs> and, 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 and the thing is that really when you're thinking about it, the concept of mishloach manot is that I'm giving you... The, it's, I, I technically, one, the, my kid once asked me, why can't we keep the mishloach manot to myself? I mean, this is great candy here. I need to give it out now some, and then I'm going to get a bad one. And they're going to give me like a, a healthy mishloach manot with, with the cucumbers in there. <laughs> so one of my kids is like, I don't like this. I want to keep the mishloach manot to myself. But that's the whole concept here, is the concept of totally putting my, the needs of somebody else in front of my needs. This is really where the secret lies, is that we're so self-centered and so egocentric, that's how you say it, egocentric, and we're so selfish, and we're so to ourselves that, that that's why we're in exile, because we only care about our small surrounding. When it comes to somebody else, no, 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 let somebody else take care of that person. Which comes the third mitzvah, of Matanot Lev Yonim, which is charity. Very, very simple. It's not sort a of sophisticated mitzvah. They just give charity. Now, giving charity, sometimes to give a coin, it's easy. To give a bill is a little bit harder. To give a piece of paper that you actually fill it in, it's even more harder because it's usually there's no bills in those amounts. But real charity is when you give out of yourself, your time, your space in your home, your expertise, your opinion. That's real charity. And again, the whole point is that if you look, what does it say in the Megillah? What does it say about us? It says, Am Echad, one nation, Mefuzar ben Amim. It's scattered all over the world. Now, Mefuzar, okay, the literal part of it is that, yeah, this guy is in England, this guy is in America, this guy is in South Africa, this guy is in Australia. So we're scattered, and it was always like that. We never had our own place. The only time we were, to, all of us together, is 40 years in the desert. That's the only time that really all the Jews were together. Even when they came into Israel, if you remember, two and a half tribes, they stayed outside. They didn't want to come in. <clears throat> and even then, we were not 100% united, and that also didn't last long. And then, 2,000 years of exile, now we're starting to, what's called Kibbutz Geluyot, we're starting to come back all to the same land. 
That's one of the, the biggest hints that we see how Mashiach is very close, is that we're starting to, to, to be gathered in the same land. But the Megillah says, Am mefuzar ben kol amim. Mefuzar is scattered. The, the, this pizur, pizur is, means to be scattered and separate. It means that we're not united. There's no unity in us. You forget about the fact that one is in uh, America now, one in Canada, one in England. That's physically. Spiritually and emotionally, we're scattered from each other. There's no unity between us. And that's where the secret lies. After that, we have the mitzvah of Mishteh. Mishteh is a, is a feast. Mishteh is a We have to have a, a, a seuda. Which in regards to the mitzvah, what we need to do, this means to be besimcha. We have to serve, serve Hashem with happiness. We have to observe the Shabbat. If you notice, the main mitzvah of Shabbat is around the table. We have a Friday night meal, a Saturday meal, a Saturday afternoon meal, a Melave Malka. It's all the celebration is around the table. So the four mitzvot that I need to focus on that actually hastens the Gula is like I said, is Mikra Megillah corresponds to Torah. I have to learn Torah. I have to have my life evolved around the Torah. And in order to do it, it means I have to learn it. Then I have to have Matanot Lev Yonim, which is charity, any, any type of charitable act. Mishloach Manot is the ultimate. Avat Israel is accepting everybody and, and, and inviting everybody into my life. And mainly, which we're going to talk about in a second, is lowering myself to make space to somebody else. And of course, the Mishteh and the, and the Suda corresponds to Ivdu et Hashem Besimcha, serve Hashem with happiness, even though our life is in, not in a good place. And there's not one person in the world that can raise their hand right now and say, my life is perfect right now. The bank account, the bank manager keeps calling me and telling me, stop putting money in the account. I, I, there's no room even anymore. And everything is beautiful in the house and the kids and the... Ah, nobody can say that. There's not one person in the world that can raise their hand and say something like that. Rather, most people will be like, huh, what are you talking about? Money, I don't really know where I'm paying my, my next uh, uh, payment of mortgage. Kids, they're all driving me crazy. This is sick, this is crazy, this is depressed. I mean, we're all going through something. And most people are juggling uh, three, four things at the same time. So nobody can come and say, my life is perfect right now. So even though my life is not 100% perfect, I'm still required to put a smile on my face. Hashem says, I, I, I know your life is not so great right now, but it doesn't mean you have to stop smiling. You have to still serve Hashem with simcha. And of course, the Mishteh corresponds to, to Shabbat, to the meals on Shabbat. So just from that, I need to learn the, f the four things that I need to apply in my life that will hasten the Geula, which that in itself is enough to deal with. But really what I want to deal, take from, from, at least from this class, to prepare in the next couple weeks is the concept that we are Am Echad, one nation, Mefuzar ben Kol Amim that we are scattered, there's no unity. And the, the, the mitzvah of Mishloach Manot comes to humble me, to tell me, take your great bag of treats, but give it to somebody else, without the expectation of getting the same bag back. If you're a little kid, you're expecting the exact same quality. But the point is that Hashem says, no, I want you to wrap the best gift in a, in a Mishloach Manot and give it to somebody random with no expectations. And really what I want to tap into in this Purim is that we, don't, we all lack of this unconditional love to any other person. We love, I love my wife and I love my kids and anybody in my circle, that's, uh, who, no, that's my family. But I go out to the street, that's it. Everybody's strangers. I don't like them, they're just the same. I would like them to till it gets uncomfortable. And most people don't even do that. And unfortunately, some people, it's even coming into their house that there's no Avat Israel in the house. Our sages say the ultimate Avat Israel is between a husband and wife. That's the ultimate Avat Israel because you're living in the same house with another individual that in some cases you can't stand. That person can drive you completely nuts. So that's the ultimate Avat Israel is to accept another person that, yeah, he's making my life a little bit hard. He, she, doesn't matter. 
So to practice Avat Israel is first of all in my home. So most people, they have not such an issue in the home. They don't hate the kids. Or there's not such a chaos in the home. If it comes already into the home and there's not Avat Israel in the home, then that's already a problem in itself that I need to tap into and get some type of a, a, a heavenly help to, get to, to calm the, the, the winds down. But we are suffering up until now in exile because of that. If somebody will need to point their finger on something, why are we in exile? Already we did everything. We did what we need to do. We went through suffering for 2,000 years. We got the point. You go now to any big rabbi or tzaddik in this generation and ask them, why are we still in exile? I mean, that's it. We showed already all the calculations. It's done. We're past all the due dates. Why are we still in exile? Of course, nobody will take the, the initiative to say, we don't know. Because really, we don't know. That's depending on the Kadosh Baruch There's a, probably a good reason why we're still in exile. But if I want to kind of hint on something why we're still in exile, it is because we cannot stand each other. And we, am echad mefuzar ben amim. I don't see myself one with everybody around me. I see myself one with myself, and with my wife and kids, and maybe my parents and siblings, and my close group of friends, and that's it. And that's, it. that's a good place. Some people, even in that, they don't see themselves one with their inner circle. And if one would need to point in something why we're in exile, then I would say that's probably the reason. Because we're still suffering from, the, from lack of respect to another person. doesn't matter who it is, who they are, how they look, how they dress, how they pronounce their words. If it's not in my group, it's not good. If it's not going the same way I go, it's not acceptable. And this is what we're lacking. And Purim comes to throw it straight into my face and he tells me, you have to accept every individual out there like as if you are one with them. That's how Mordechai actually was able to annul the decree. He got all the kids together in, a, in shuls and he made them chant Torah. But he got everybody aroused to like each other. And unfortunately, we don't have a Mordechai in our generation to come and say, come on, guys, we're all the same. I mean, maybe we have different skin complexion. Maybe I dress a little bit different than you. Or I pronounce a word a little bit different than you. You say, oh, and I say, oi. Who cares? We're all following the same Torah. We all like the same God. And we all want out of this mess. If it's almost like having now a bunch of people on a sinking ship. And instead of taking the water out and working like a team, they argue with each other. You brought the water. I didn't bring the water. You made the crack. No, you made the crack. And instead of saving ourselves, we're sinking in and we're sinking and we're sinking. And the Kadosh Baruch is standing in Shemaim and says, why don't they get it? Why don't they get it? All I want is just a little bit of peace here. And the way to kind of relate with how Hashem feels, just imagine how Hashem feels. It's equal to how you feel when your kids fight with each other. When you're sitting and you want to relax, Friday afternoon, you're dead tired, you want to sit, catch a little bit of sleep, and the kids fight with each other. And they scream at each other, and they hit each other. And, and I mean, when, I, when my kids get along, ooh, it's the biggest nachat. If I see them together, the other day I saw one of my boys, he came to the, his sister, he hugged her, he told her, I love her, this is a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And I was like, oh. As a nachat. This, is, this is what I need to see. Just my kids hugging each other and liking each other. And here, one of my kids, the other day, they had some treat. The, the younger one, it fell on the floor. The older one came, told him, here, you can take mine. I was like, oh, th that's what I want. But when they chas v'shalom fight, and, and you know what they fight over? A piece of plastic. It's my toy. It's my toy. It was mine before. Oh. And they fight on a piece of plastic. And they, sometimes they, they will kill each other. And, they, and the, the, the energy between is, is unbearable. I can't stand that. And this is how Hashem looks at us. Now if I do some type of actual charitable act towards somebody that I don't really know. If it's somebody that I know, it's not such a big chokhmah to help my, my, my mother. I mean, some people, that's for them also a problem. But to help somebody that I don't even know? Imagine the nachat that the Kadosh Baruch gets in Shemaim. And then when Hashem sees us fighting over a toy or a little piece of plastic, 
He, 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 I, can, I can imagine how Hashem feels when we fight over nothing, over nonsense. Merely that you'd say something serious, but over nonsense? And that's our problem. And we're kind of like beating ourselves up in a sinking ship without noticing that, hey, let's come down for a second. If we all work together, we can actually get ourselves out of this jam. And Purim comes to point this out. That's why Purim says, listen, drink, okay? Relax. Drink a lot, so you'll be happy. And really go, you know, break your, your, your barriers and enjoy and, and start liking everybody else. And that's, that's what the, the point of the holiday is to come and tell me you have to be holy. First of all, we cannot not be not holy. We're a holy nation. We have to be holy. So we start with a fast and then we start with reading a Megillah and everything is nice and holy. But we end with a party, eating and getting drunk. Why? Because Hashem says, listen, if, if without that you're too stiff, you can't, you can't like each other. So just drink. Drink and eat and relax. But really... We had at the time a decree against us that we were, we were supposed to be annihilated by Haman. He wanted to annihilate us. And in our generation also, there are a few individuals that want to wipe us off the map. If you would give them the opportunity, they would do that a long time ago. We are in a, in a, in a state of danger. I mean, there are nations and individuals that want to annihilate us. But more than that, that I less care about. That is in the hands of the Kadosh Baruch Kadosh Baruch wants something to happen, it will happen, doesn't matter what, what, what I want to do about it. Of course I have to be aware of that. But we can totally annul that problem and any other problems in my life, all it takes is the Kadosh Baruch says, just, just give somebody a Mishloach Manot. Just lower yourself. Do the act of kindness, but not just a simple act of kindness. Is, is, you know, when, when, when I give a Mishloach Manot and I have an expectation to get something back, A, I have high expectations, B, I have expectations because my ego tells me, you deserve a very nice Mishloach Manot, because you just gave one. And my ego comes and tells me, you're such a good Jew. You help, and you donate, and you're a great mother, you get a great father, and you're unbelievable in your community. You deserve to be respected and honored and, and get this and that. And that's the whole point of Purim, that tells you, no, don't, don't, lower your ego, you're not that great yourself, you have your own debts, your spiritual debts, and it's not about you getting a Mishloach Manot. It's about you giving the Mishloach Manot. And what I want to get from that is that very soon on Purim is going to be the day that I can actually tap into this energy and derive the power to apply it. If I don't apply it, then there's, a, there's, there's no point. Our sages say, the action is the most important. If I sit now in shul or in a synagogue and I learn Torah all day long, but I don't apply it, then what's the point? It's a waste of time. That's why you see sometimes, unfortunately, you see many religious people in our generation that they behave in a disgraceful way. And what do the not religious people say? Oh, you sit and learn Torah all day long and that's how you behave? That's what they say. And, and they, they are... Totally legit. Uh, you're right. How can you sit in a yeshiva all day long and learn Torah and then go and curse and hit and be violent and steal and do disgraceful things? You're, you're distorting the Torah. So the point is that the Kadosh Baruch is, he tried in many different ways to get the point across. Since we're a, a very stubborn nation, it seems that we're not getting the point. So Hashem is putting more pressure and more pressure and more pressure that we will get the point. So say, ah, okay, life is not so easy right now because I, I, Hashem wants me to do something. That's it. Mashiach is coming very soon. I have to initiate a change. I have to do something within me. But we're very tired. Uh, this life has already made us very tired. All these challenges that we go through, you know, and he was any koach. I don't, I can't take it anymore. Just, I, I need a break already. That's the emotion what everybody feels. I can't take this anymore. The chinuch, it's so hard. The shlom bayit, the parnasa, it's everything. It's all together. I'm, free, I'm choked already. I can't take this anymore. So, Hashem says, just a, a few more breaths. 
But the point is that, you, you know, sometimes you go around in circles and you, you're beating the point. The point is that Hashem says, all I, all I want to see from you is I want you to like other people. I want you to accept them. And <clears throat> amazingly, we read a few weeks ago that Yosef HaTzadik was in jail. Now, there's, a, of course, a big question of such a tzaddik, why would he be in jail? But the point is that Hashem wanted us to, us to teach it wanted, Hashem wanted to teach us something through the suffering of the tzaddik. And he was 12 years in jail. 12 years, that's a, that's a pretty serious sentence. In the jail in Egypt, it wasn't like now the, the nice jails you have now with internet and beds and, and uh, visiting hours. It was a dungeon. It was in a dungeon for 12 years. And the story comes to tell us, when the Torah comes to tell me a story, it comes to teach me something. Because the Torah comes from the word hora'ah, to teach. So the story is that besides the miracle that the Kadosh Baruch took Yosef out of jail, how was it dressed in nature? That one time, after 10 years, these two individuals come to the jail, Sarah Mashkim and Sarah Ofim, and they wake up in the morning very upset because they had a bad dream. Now at the time it says that Yosef was the ruler of the jail. He was like kind of like the, running the, the show there. And the Torah says that he approached them and told them, why do you look so uh, sad? What happened? And of course they told him about the dream. He solved the dream. Two years later, when Paro had his dream, they said, oh, there's a little uh, Jewish boy in the, jo in the jail. Bring him out. He knows how to read the, to interpret the dreams. So really, what was his salvation? How was he dressed into nature? By these two individuals. But how it was allowed to happen? By the fact that he cared why they don't feel so good in the morning and why they had a sad face. If he had a little bit of an ego by saying, listen, I'm the head of the jail. I'm running the jail here. If he had just a little bit of an ego, he would be like, I don't care if you're sad or not today. But he took out of his time to approach them and tell them, what, what's wrong? You don't look like you're having a, such a good day. That allowed him to go into a conversation with them and then to, to understand that he, they had the dreams, to solve the dreams, that two years later, that was his ticket out. Yes, of course, it was done, the miracle was done by, the, by Hashem, but it had to be dressed into nature. And the, 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 the learning to take from this whole story is that his Yeshua, his salvation, came from the fact that he cared about somebody foreign, and asked him, why do you look sad? How can I help you? Maybe I can help you. That was his, his salvation, his Yeshua. And a Kadosh Baruch constantly throws people into my life. That they're not coming to me with a present. They're coming to me with a problem. And I usually don't want to hear their problem. I slam the door in their face. Oh, you're, you're the tenth person who's asking for charity today. You're the tenth person who's asking me to, to take you in into my house today. I don't have more room for, for guests in my Shabbat meal, or whatever it is. Shem constantly throws somebody in my face that is asking for my help. Now, in most cases, I'm very quick to... Oh, that's what I, most people do. This, this sigh. Another one. Really, one should say, wait a minute. Maybe my salvation is in this person. Maybe that person has came to, to now help me, to get me out. I mean, I'm dealing now with my issue over here. It could be that that person is the person that will actually save me. And Hashem says, I sent so many people to help you. Because we pray all day long, Hashem, help me with my parnasa. Hashem, help me with my kids. Hashem, help me with my husband. Hashem, help me with my sickness. And then we, have, we go and complain. Why didn't you help me? If Hashem would talk to us, he would say, like, I did. I sent you so many people. This guy, you closed the door in his face. That guy, you didn't want to take a, as, a, as a ride. This guy, you weren't uh, willing to listen to him. All these people, they had answers to you. You just didn't give them a time of day. So the point that we want to take from that is that we are Am Echad Mefuzar Ben Amim. Am Echad, Am, am Echad. I'm am, 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 am me. Me, myself, and me. Me and my ego, and I'm scattered. It means I don't want, no, 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 you stay where you are, you stay where you are, don't come into my place, don't start getting too close to me. 
And Hashem says, no, you have to completely change that. And when you change that, that's when actually Hashem is dressing His miracles in nature. Because miracles, can, they have to be dressed in nature. They cannot be not dressed in nature. You cannot sit all day long like this and the mailman will knock on your door. Here's the $2 million check you were dreaming about. You have to do something. It has to be dressed into nature. You know the famous story that one person came to the Lubavitch Rebbe and told him, I want to be very rich. So he told him, okay, so buy a lottery ticket and I'll give you a bracha that you'll win. And of course, a few months later, he comes back again. He says, listen, I never became rich. Your bracha didn't work. So he told him, did you buy the ticket, the lottery ticket, like I told you? So you have to buy the ticket, of course, if you want to win the lottery. Now, I'm not telling you all along to buy lottery tickets. <coughs> but we have to initiate something. And <coughs> the holiday of Purim comes to tell me what I need to initiate. And not only that it tells me what I need to initiate, on the day of Purim, I have the ability to tap into this energy to get the core, the power to actually do it. Because you know what they say in English? Easier said than done. In theory, everything is easy. <coughs> when it's coming to practicality, that's already hard to do. So on Purim is the time that I can actually take some of this energy and, and benefit from it that it will allow me to actually bring it down to action. And the action is that, that I have to, to lower my expectations, lower my ego, put myself more out there, help another person that has nothing to do with me. And the hint that we see amazingly is after Purim comes Pesach. Pesach, of course, signifies the, the redemption, the freedom. If I'm able to apply this in Purim, then I'll reach my own redemption, my own freedom. That, I, yes, I will have financial burden, but it's not going to be such a problem, okay? It will just be there. Like a scratch on a car. Yeah, okay, so the car scratch as well. So it's there. The car still drives. So it's not so it's, uh, perfect to my eye, whatever. So my, my problems can be, first of all, be removed from me, or they can stay there, but without having me being affected by them. And it all boils down to how much I'm, I'm not considering myself as so important, and how I'm more accepting everybody around me to who they are and what they are, whether it's with my relationship with my spouse, or my kids, or my neighbors, it can be affected in any in every area. So, <clears throat> let's conclude. Bezad Hashem. Then we'll take some questions. What I want to conclude from that is that we're still in exile, and we're in exile because of sinat chinam. I know many people say we're in exile because of this sin, because of that sin. Nobody really knows. The Kadosh Baruch Hu didn't send us an, an email telling us why, but you can kind of uh, uh, guess real good that we're still in exile because of Sinat Chinam. That's why we went out to exile and that's why we're, we're in it probably till we finish with the Sinat Chinam. And every, every person has some type of Sinat Chinam to somebody else. Sinat Chinam is hating another person for no reason. And the Sinat Chinam can come in many different ways. A lot of people say, no, I like everybody. Sinat Chinam can be coming in many different forms. Even just by being jealous of somebody else's success that's also Sinat Chinam. Sometimes you see people, they, they become successful in what they do, and other people are jealous of them. Why is he so successful? I've been trying to do this for 10 years, and he's successful. That's not fair. That's also Sinat Chinam. Why you be happy with the, the success of somebody else? So the one point I want to take from that is I want to apply in my life is to be focused all day long where am I failing in this Sinat Chinam, and to be aware <clears throat> that every time that I do, to maybe write it down and say, okay, 427, I, I failed in Sinat Chinam by doing this and that. And if you keep some type of a track, it will give you an, an analogy. How many times a day you are, you are basically failing in this particular department. And if you're true to yourself and you're really honest with yourself, then it will give you a good analogy to, to tell you where, where you're holding. It's almost like you'll come now to a person that has high blood sugar, blood uh, uh, pressure, and you'll tell them, listen, you're having a lot of sugar all day long. No, I'm not having sugar all day long. I, 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 I swear to you, I barely have any sugar. 
And then if you monitor the entire day, three cups of coffee, two croissants, one rogalach, one cookie, one this, oh, to put it together, it's a lot of sugar every day. So when we don't focus on what we actually do, it doesn't look so much. Uh, and not too long ago, a certain individual that I know, he came, he told me, hey, I, I, started, I saw him changing his diet. I told him what happened. He told me, the doctor told me, I have high cholesterol, I have high blood pressure, I have to cut the sugar from my diet. And he's like, you know, I never noticed that I drink and eat so much sugar. Well, you know, you drink coffee, juices, all these things. He's like, now I'm noticing when I put my mind to it, how much sugar I was actually taking. So we don't notice how much sinat chinam we have into anyone. It can be as close to as my wife or my next door neighbor or this random person that just was, you know, next to me in the supermarket. So really what I want to focus on till the time that Purim comes is to be aware that can only happen if I, I humble myself. Because <clears throat> if I'm not going to humble myself, I'm not going to be honest. And then I'm not going to write the report the right way. But you want to make your own report till Purim, how many times a day you are really failing to see a, a, a good analogy where you're holding. Am I really bad in Sinat Chinam or am I not so bad? Or is my Sinat Chinam only in my home or is it in my neighborhood or it's all over the place? And by that, it will allow me to see how good or not good I am. So when Purim comes, I can tap into in those 24 hours 48 hours, and to tap into and, says, and, and to focus on, this is the energy that I want to derive. I want to derive the ability to be more patient with the people that I can't stand. I want to derive the, the, the ability to be more uh, caring and understanding and loving and forgiving, because I don't want to. When I'm holding all this negativity in me, it's affecting me. Forget about right now affecting the entire world <coughs> and the redemption and the exile. It's affecting me. So really Purim is a very special holiday. That's why if you do the whole thing, then you end the holiday with a party. You're happy. And this is ultimately what we're looking at. We're looking to be happy. We're all looking to be satisfied and content in our life and to have this happiness, Simcha. So we all have to do is follow these little steps. <clears throat> Bezad Hashem, we can find in us the place to, to remove this spiritual dirt, and by default, when you move the spiritual dirt out, then good energy, which will correspond to simcha, to real simcha, will come in instead. And needless to say, how much it will hasten my personal redemption, and later on, of course, the general redemption, Bezad Hashem, it should happen very, very soon. And we'll wish you already a beautiful Purim, Chag Sameach, and successful journey <coughs> in your mission.